Welcome back to MRank, guys. And as you can tell, we went to the world scene and got Mike back. Yeah, may have disappeared there for a bit, but they brought me back a lot. Sadly, we did lose Coho, yeah. but he sacrificed train. himself yeah. and his hair. But I'm back. I, I mean, we got Mike, so it's okay to lose Coho, I guess. Fair trade. I'll do it every time. Yeah. So for today. We have an interesting episode, right, Mike? Yes. We're going to talk about some of the greatest movies of all time. Picked by our guest today, Mr. The Quote, Ryan Permison. We still got the quote? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Still <laughs> got the quote. I'm very still happy to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. So, uh, you have seen a lot of movies? Uh, yeah, there are a lot of people in our circle of friends that would say I haven't. Some people would say Ryan's been living under a rock for the last three decades. Some people would say this guy's out of his mind. He doesn't know what a good movie is when it slaps him in the face. But you know what? It's the beauty of movies. Everybody has different tastes. Everybody has different likes. Everybody has different dislikes. And that is the best thing about this community is that we can lo love and we can love our films. We can respect them. We can cheer them on. But at the end of the day, doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong because we are entitled to our opinions and we are entitled to enjoy the movies that we so enjoy. So let's just support those movies and respect people's opinions and not tear each other down. I like it. Fair. I agree with this. Yeah. Yes. Fact, I trust it so much. I'm just going to call this the best movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's start right away. What is the 10th best movie ever? Oh, boy, is the comment section just going to be thrilled when they hear what's on this list, ladies and gentlemen. Coming in at number 10, we have a film that is very inspiring, has got a great cast with it, and a really good director and a great score uh, to it as well. And if you build it, he will come. And I'm going with Kevin Costner, Ray Liotta, and whoever else is in this movie. James, James <laughs> Jones, Field of Dreams. <laughs> Yes, Field of Dreams is an inspirational film for so many different reasons. Whether you've lost a loved one or not, someone, somewhere, somehow can relate on this film in any given level. It doesn't matter if you're five years old or 105. Field of Dreams is an incredible movie that came out at the tail end of a great decade for films known as the 1980s. And boy, what a way to go out in 89 with director Phil Alden Robinson. And you got the score by James freaking Horner. A great you do love that man. You do love that man. Yeah, a great <laughs> composer in his own right. And Field of Dreams, I got to give this film credit. I just wa re watched this movie a couple weeks ago in celebration of Father's Day. Although my biological father is no longer with us, he is up north. We, lo we love you, Dad. We miss you. But Field of Dreams, man, that film hits me so much. And it's a great film in so many different ways. So I got to give it to Field of Dreams at number 10. I actually uh, really enjoyed this film. Uh, more for the spiritual part than the baseball part, although I really like baseball. And I have this on my top 10 baseball movies of all time. I think it's around seven, maybe. Mm. Uh, but it is my it is my second favorite uh, Kevin Costner baseball movie because Paul Durham. <laughs> Paul Durham. <laughs> but, yeah, oh, boy. Actually, actually, this is a pretty good pick. Uh, yeah. yeah. We, we are off to a good start, Mike. Why do you hate Field of Dreams? <laughs> I do not hate Field of Dreams. I was going to say, how can you hate this movie? How I can anyone hate this movie? I enjoy it. And you know what? This isn't a bad pick to be on someone's best list or favorite list, whatever you want to say, because people do love this movie. So this is actually a decent pick for being a number 10. I respect the hell out of that. Mm. Good yeah. start. Let's yeah. see where we go. <laughs> no, oh, not. wow. We can go nowhere but down now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry. And by the way, I've just recently seen Bull Durham. I don't think it's that good. Uh, it's not well, that good. Ladies and gentlemen, we had that our favorite show, best movies ever made. I'm sorry. <laughs> we only did one, but uh, I mean. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Just kidding. What are you doing to me? Come on. <laughs> Bull Dur like Between Bull Durham and Field Dreams, they are two very different movies on two very different sides of the coin. I'm just saying. But anyway, moving on. Number nine. We're going to go with number nine, okay? Number nine. You may there's a few films from this genre that are that may or may not appear on this list. We'll wait and see what happens when we go forward. Number nine, I think it's the best 
movie when it comes to the main part of this franchise, not the spinoff part of it, because the spinoffs are a different thing entirely. I love it when a marketing campaign for a film is great, and then when you go into the theater and see the film, it's just as great, if not better, than what the marketing campaign is. Because we've seen great trailers for bad movies, right? We've seen bad trailers for good movies. That's what kind of happens when you go in to see a film, right? But this one delivered on all fronts, and it brought two generations of actors together and teamed them up, and it's just a great, great comic book movie. I'm kicking it with X-Men Days of Future Past. Yes, to me, this is the best X-Men movie ever made, not counting the spinoffs, because I'm not counting the Deadpools or the, or the Wolverine films. I'm talking about X-Men, pure X-Men, right? Days of Future Past is the best one, at least in my eyes. And it's my favorite uh, overall X-Men film, too. So I got so much out of this movie. I think it has great dramatic performances. I think it tugs at your heartstrings to a certain extent. I got teary-eyed when you have one Professor Xavier meeting the, the other Professor Xavier. Like, that scene between James McAvoy and Patrick Stewart, that hits you, man. That is, like, magic. That is a great coming together of the minds and just a great scene in general and the imagery that's used during the course of that scene and how it plays out is so good it's so good and by the way both cuts of this movie are good the theatrical cut and the road cut they're both really good cuts of the movie if you haven't seen the road cut give it a chance i think you'll really like it i think it does add to the movie i think it enhances it a little bit more but no matter what version you watch you're still going to get a great x-men movie no matter what so jennifer lawrence i mean hugh jackman holly berry patrick stewart ian mckellen ellen page i mean who sean who's who is in this movie folks who's who is in it they, they got a stacked cast and it's great so i'm going to give it to x-men days future past coming in at number nine i have a question ask away does the rogue code add more rogue in the movie <laughs> <laughs> i mean She's not in the theatrical cut, so yeah, it adds plenty in the Rogue cut. So yeah, Rogue, Rogue's in the film. Uh, not a huge, huge amount, but she's in it enough. She's in it enough. So Because she's really not in the, she's not in the theatrical cut, but in the Rogue cut, she's in it. So yeah, I would give it to her. I don't think this is a bad movie. I actually enjoyed it when I saw it. Uh, I, haven't, I don't really know how, how much has aged because honestly, I think this was probably the last X-Men movie I actually enjoyed. A theater, that oh, yeah. were, well, not counting Logan because I'm talking right. about just X Men. The two that came after this, eh, no. <laughs> uh, but I also like some other movies better than this. I think uh, First Class is better than this. I think X Two is better than this. Uh, but fair, nine best movie out of all time, a little high for me. Uh, but still, Mike, why do you love this movie so much? <laughs> It's a good fucking movie, but like Nazario said, I think there are better X-Men movies, and being on the top ten of all time, uh, fair. Uh, uh, fair coming from you, it's fair. <laughs> Number eight, my man. I know. Oh, there's so many directions we can go with this list. Okay, so coming to number eight, right? Uh, number eight, this movie was a big influence on me uh, growing up when I was originally watching it. I still think it holds up today. I still think it's an entertaining film to this day. I think you can get a lot of laughs out of it, really. And unfortunately, we lost an actor way too soon. Uh, granted, he passed away many years after this film had come out, but it's still very sad that we lost him. Rest in peace. I'm going with Robin Williams' Aladdin. I'm kicking it with Disney. I'm going to go with Aladdin. I think Aladdin is hilarious. I think there's a bit of a few good you know, moral lessons to get out of it. And plus... Anytime the genie's on screen is going to be a good time, no matter what time of day it is, no matter what year or century you're in, it's going to be fun. You're going to get so much enjoyment out of it. And the songs in this movie, they're really good. I mean, you've never had a friend like me, uh, a whole new world. You have uh, Arabian Nights, the opening title. I think it's the opening sequence song. I mean, it's so good. And the thing that I didn't even know about this movie until I found out about it a little time ago, a short while ago the genie was the voice of the shopkeeper in the opening scene yeah. of the movie. I had no idea that was Robin Williams. I'm like, dang, is there anything this guy can't do? 
honest, honest to God. Think of like, the genies and shopkeepers. Yeah. Yeah, he was. The, it's, it's like salam and good evening to you, worthy friends. Please, please come closer. Too close. A little too close. And welcome to Agrabah, city of mystery and enchantment. I mean, it's so, it's so quotable. It's so good. Like every time I quoted this movie in theater, excuse me, when I was in my uh, classroom when I was a kid. So, so much fun. And by the way, his impressions when he's trying to convince uh, Al or Aladdin to like go up to her uh, tower and say hi to her, like just talk to her. It's like, right, Sparky, here's the deal. If you want to court the little lady, you got to be a straight shooter too. You got it? What do you mean? Tell her the truth. It's like, it's so good. So I'm going to give it to Aladdin at number eight. Does this surprise any of you guys? Probably, probably not. No, uh, not really. Because... Spoilers, we did the other show before. <laughs> I know, but, right? <laughs> uh, We're having a strange feeling of deja vu in the booth. <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good movie. I'm not going to say it's not, because it is. I think, actually, that uh, basically they just taped Robin Williams doing everything he wanted to do and then animated around it. Uh, the shopkeeper thing, actually, it's a funny story. Originally, they were going to reveal... It was going to be a part of the movie that he reveals that the guy narrating the movie in the end was actually the genie, like a surprise. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm free now, but I still wanted to give the props to the history of my man here, Aladdin. They kind of did this on the on the live action with Guy Ritchie because uh, they start the movie with uh, Will Smith married with somebody that they don't show and two kids in a boat and they talk like, hey, but daddy tells a story and he starts telling them the story. And then... At the end, they reveal that, yes, his wife is the woman the genie uh, hooked up with during the movie, yeah. and he's actually the genie, and now he's free, and he's living life as a human with kids. So it's kind of what they wanted to do with the original one, but for some huh. reason, they just didn't do it. Hmm. Except is- the part with the kids and the wife. But the, the narrator thing, yeah, same. This is one but- of my favorite animated movies, and um, so I... I have no faults with this being on a list like this because, yeah, a lot of people love the hell out of this movie, including me. So, yeah, it's a decent pick for being on top ten here. I do have to say, though, there is so much great animation in the world. This is a little boat. A little boat. (laughs) But I like it. Number seven. (laughs) Oh, boy. Latin is so much fun. But anyway, number seven. Uh, You may... This person shows up on the list again. Uh, Robin Williams got an oh. Oscar for this movie. I'm going to go with uh, Good Will Hunting uh, Ooh, with Matt Damon, uh-huh. Ben Affleck, Robin Williams, Minnie Driver, uh, you know, Stellan, I believe it's Stellan, Stellan Skarsgård, among others. Uh, very good film. I think it's a great coming of age movie. I think it's a great dramatic film. And Robin Williams, he can do no wrong. He can play the funny guy, but he can also play a very serious, you know, human being who's going through some stuff of his own while he's working with will hunting to try to get him back on the right foot to try to get him back in the right place it's the whole movie in a way is like one giant therapy session in a way if if you think about it it kind of is but it's so good and it got all the oscar buzz and the oscar retention the awards that it got deservedly so i mean robert williams got the oscar best i think it was best supporting actor that year so is good will hunting good yeah but in my opinion i think it's a great film not just good it's great so if I want to watch a great Robin Williams movie, or I'm just in, I'm just in the mood to watch a great dramatic film overall, I got to give it to Good Will Hunting because Matt Damon and Ben Affleck as like brothers in this movie, and you have Casey Affleck, uh, you have a bunch of other actors in this movie. It's just it's so good, and the chemistry between everybody in this movie is good too. It just it just works for what they were going for, and it has one of the more unique soundtracks I've ever heard in my life because I'm not familiar with a lot of the artists that were featured in this movie. I'm not familiar with some of the music that was featured in this movie. But to hear it, it was like, okay, I get it. It has its own atmosphere. It has its own vibe. And I respect the heck out of that. So I'm going to give it to Good Will Hunting at number seven. I really like the music too. I think it's one of the most original soundtracks for the age. Mm-hmm. Uh, this got songs by Sam Elliott, right? I think it was is this the one with Miss Misery. Hmm. Anyway. That is a very good, uh, it's a very good soundtrack. Also, uh, I like them apples. And the driver is actually pretty good in this movie too. Oh yeah. And, yeah, as a movie that in well, I knew Ben Affleck because of Mallrats, but I didn't really know Matt Damon. I had seen Chasing Amy, but the guy is so few seconds in it that you couldn't yeah. really. Tell. And after this one, I just realized like, hmm, this guy can really act, and it's funny to me. 
this launched both their careers like into the superstardom, but uh, they did take different paths, didn't they? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think Matt Damon made a bad movie until probably Brothers, uh, Brothers Grimm. And Ben Affleck didn't make a good movie until probably The Town. So, <laughs> weird. What's the matter? You didn't like Jersey Girl? No, I'm kidding. Oh, kind of. I like Jersey Girl. I mean, not a lot of people do, but I'm, I'm in the minority. I liked it. And plus, when you have Liv Tyler, hello there. I don't hate I'm it. Just, I'm just but saying. I don't hate Jill either, so who knows oh, what the fuck boy. I like. Oh, boy. Wow. Mike, go to Hunting. Good uh, pick. It's a great fucking movie. Uh, this is another one that I'm not surprised would end up on a top 10 list because it's fantastic. It has so much heart to it, so much soul to it. Robin Williams is fucking incredible in this movie. And Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, their writing is fucking amazing. Like, damn. For them to be able to put this out there as their first written movie is amazing. Yeah, this is a great fucking pick. They never did another one, did they? Together? No, like right. I, no, I, I know Matt Damon wrote with Casey Affleck, Gary. Yeah, but I, I don't think he did they, anything. With they that. had an upcoming one together, but I don't think it ever got picked up. That right. was supposed to happen, I think, like last year, but it didn't right. happen. I remember well, hearing about that too. They're they're kind of young. <laughs> Let's see what happens with life. Yeah. <laughs> kinda Number young. six. Six, six, six. Yeah, six is good. At least I hope it is. Um, another great actor who uh, a lot of people consider to be America's dad. This is one of those actors who really can do no wrong. But he has made one or two blunders. Let's be honest. No one's 100% perfect unless you're, you know, uh, well, not counting his t TV stuff, but just his film stuff. Henry Cavill's great. But this guy, Tom Hanks, did a film that got a lot of buzz, a lot of attention, a lot of awards that year came out. And I think it's a really good dramatic film. I think it's a good coming of age story. I think it's a good, there's a lot of moral lessons to be learned from this movie about putting the past behind you, moving on, doing something with your life and going for it. Just run around America for a couple of years. That'll do it. Good. I'm going with Forrest Gump, baby. I'm going with Forrest Gump. I mean, him, Robin Wright, you got Sally Field, who plays one of the best like motherly roles I've seen in a movie. She's one of the best actresses I've ever seen. I mean, just anybody, pretty much anybody. And Gary Sinise is Lieutenant Dan. I mean, you got new legs. New legs. I mean, come on. Gary Sinise as Lieutenant Dan Taylor. Come on. So good. So quotable. Robert Zemeckis. Everybody who worked behind the scenes on this movie. Everyone who helped put this movie together did a, such a good job. And I know a lot of people like to hammer on this movie and like to bury it into the ground and like kick it while it's down. I'm like, why? This movie is so good. I don't know why anybody would hate this movie. It doesn't make really whole much sense to me why anyone would hate this movie. It's so good for a multitude of different reasons. And you can relate to this film whether you're 10 years old or 50 years old. It doesn't matter. You can relate to it on some way, shape, or form, some level. Another good score, too. I'm not going to deny that. But, yeah, Forrest Gump, Tom Hanks. I'm a big Tom Hanks fan. I'm a big Tom Hanks supporter. So I'm going to give it to Forrest Gump on this one. I don't hate Forrest Gump. Uh, I do not think this movie has aged particularly well. Yeah. I think there are some some aspects on it that maybe were not as roughly received back then, but now looking back, it's kind of a little bit uh, okay. Uh, I don't want to play the race card or anything, but this movie's central idea is basically like. If you're a white guy, you can be a simpleton and still succeed in life. Like, really succeed in life. Uh, at least that's the way some people see it now. Uh, as a movie, Robert Zemeckis, to me, is a great director. He did, I don't think uh, he did a bad movie until What Lies Beneath. And even though that one is not great, it's all right. Uh, but this is a rough pick, my man, because in 94... Even just the movies that were nominated with this. This beat The Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. This beat Pulp Fiction. Quiz show. <laughs> this, I mean, for weddings and a funeral, I can give and take, but I don't know, man. I mean, don't hate it again. I think it's fun. I think it's very quotable. I find it very entertaining every time I watch it. But, oof. Six... <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm kind of in agreement with Nazario. I do enjoy this movie. I love Tom Hanks, but I don't consider this top tier Tom Hanks. But 
it does have its moments, it, it, but it has definitely aged pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it, and that's fine. That's completely fine, yeah. and it's fair too. I completely understand. Still, at least you haven't put a bad movie yeah. on the list. I hope not. <laughs> so now we're getting to the top five. Top Good five, time. people. Top five. Coming in at number five. Man, this is a film I grew up on. This is a film I saw in the theaters with my late father. God rest his soul. He took me to see this movie in 95. I was jacked up. I was ready to go. My first experience. I've seen bits and pieces of other of a film that he really enjoys in this franchise. But this was my first seeing it, you know, full length feature film of this franchise okay going into this i was like okay i hope this is good i hope it delivers and it did it made me want to become this character it made me want to just sign my life away and be in the next film uh that came out in 97 pierce brosnan isabella skorupko famka jansen uh gosh what's sean was it sean bean yes what's that Yes, he was, Sean Bean. <laughs> yeah, Sean Bean. Sean Bean, who, lo- who loves to die in every single movie he's in, folks. He does it with a smile. Goldeneye, baby. Goldeneye. Yes, James Bond was introduced to me via Goldeneye in theaters in 1995. I remember going to the theater to see this, how excited I was. And when I came out of the theater, I was my jaw was on the floor. My eyes were bulging out of their sockets. I was blown away by this movie for so many different reasons. And when you have two beautiful women in this movie, Isabella Skorupko, who unfortunately, I haven't seen you in anything since Vertical Limit with Chris O'Donnell in 2000, Isabella. Where have you been? What are you doing? You should have been in so many more movies after GoldenEye. I'm just saying. And Famke Jansen, nobody knew who she was until this movie came out. And then five years later, she stars in one of the most influential comic book movies or comic book franchises of all time with X-Men. So it's to see her... A little bit younger playing Zen on the top. On the top? On the top. Your accent, Jordan? Very good, Mr. Bond. You've been to Russia. I used to drop in occasionally. Shoot in and out. I mean, it's just... Oh, my God. That scene in the casino or the club, whatever it was, I wanted to be in that suit. I wanted to order vodka martini. Shaken. Not stupid. And for you, the same. How do you take it? Straight up with a twist. And I'm like, oh my God, such a great way to introduce a character. It's such a great way to introduce a character. Thank you, Mr. James Bond. James Bond. I mean, it's just, oh, I wish I was there. I wish I was there on set that day. But GoldenEye is a great action adventure movie. And Martin Campbell rebooted the Bond franchise, not once, but twice he did it with Golden Eye '95. Then he does it a decade and some change, decade and some change later with Doesn't Daniel hear. freaking with Daniel freaking Craig and Casino Royale, baby. And also yeah. he directed The Mask of freaking Zorro, The Mask of Zorro, another excellent action adventure film that maybe not be on this list, but whatever, it's fun anyway. Golden Eye, License to Kill, it may fantastic. or may not be on the list. We have four spots left. <laughs> yeah, may or may not be on the list, but GoldenEye is on this list, and it's coming in at the top five. To me, it's my favorite Bond film. Is it the best Bond film? Not sure. i got to think about that for another two minutes. But GoldenEye, personal favorite. Plus, the video game for N64 doesn't hurt either. Guys, what do you think about GoldenEye? The first thing I'm going to say is, great. Yeah. Great drop of Vertical Limit. Yeah. Vertical Limit is an underrated, fun-ass movie. Shit, yes, man. Vertical yes, it's a great shit. survival disaster film. Everybody Martin should Campbell, go watch Martin Vertical Campbell, Limit. Martin Campbell directed. Oh, yeah. Bill Paxton, the biggest dickhead ever. Oh, dude, <laughs> Bill, Bill Paxton, everybody in that movie was so good. And you get introduced to a young Robin Tunney, who I didn't even know who she was until Vertical Limit. I know she was in The Craft, but I didn't know and who she was record. until... Yep. Yeah, yep, and that too, but I didn't know who she was until Vertical Limit. She was cute. And then she ended up doing The Mentalist for six years on CBS, but that's a different story entirely. Back to this movie. Uh, yeah, Golden Eye. Yes. yes. Yes, my second favorite uh, Pierce Brosnan movie, one of the top James Bond movies, because uh, actually James Bond movies, I don't know if this is a controversial opinion or not, they're kind of meh, most of them. I mean, I my favorite, favorite, favorite Bond is Timothy Dalton, and he only did, he only got to the two movies. Uh, I would put one of his movies above this one, and probably two or two of the Daniel Craig ones, because I do think Casino Royale and Skyfall are better than this. But definitely top five, because one Dalton, two Craigs, Tomorrow Never Dies. No, wait, not Tomorrow Never Dies. The world is not enough. And then this. <laughs> top five, man. I take it. Mike. There you go. Okay. 
This is my second favorite Bond movie. I'll, I have Casino Royale right over it. Great but picks. it also is to the fact that I hate James Bond. <laughs> wow. I do not care for James Bond movies at Yikes. all. I've tried it multiple times. Just not my character at all. Okay. But, you know, it's totally you. So I get why it's on here. <laughs> you sell this thing so well, yeah. man, that kind of makes you forget that some of them are not great. Let's move on. <laughs> Number cuatro. <laughs> oh, we're having so much fun. Uh, number f- <laughs> number four. Um, you know, there was a question that was posed to me a little earlier on in a certain show involving, I think, the two members of this panel. Do you choose this director or this director? And I went one way. But this film, I've watched this film so many times more so than the other ones from the other director, respectively. The fact that I grew up on this movie, the fact that this was my introduction to this comic book character, and the fact that it has the best rescue, one of the best rescue sequences in a movie, one of the best-looking cars in a movie, and also just a fun, funny, quotable movie that you can watch any day of the week and twice on a Sunday. I probably, I'll be honest with you, I probably watch this movie 20, 30 times in a year. 20, 30 times a year, maybe more, because it's so rewatchable. It doesn't bother me. I can have it on in the background. I can have it on and actually, you know, focus my eyes on it when it's playing. I'm kicking it with Michael Keaton's Batman 1989. Yes, the original Batman film, the true original Batman film. I'm sorry, Adam West, your film doesn't count because it's a straight up. For me, it's a parody. It's not a Batman movie. It's a parody. When it comes to Batman as a character, as a story, this is the movie that started off for me. It's Batman 1989. You had a young, up-and-coming filmmaker at the time. Tim Burton was killing it with two movies. Pee-wee's Big Adventure, which was a fun movie, and I still enjoyed it to this day. By the way, I met Morgan Fairchild at a Comic-Con. She was great. Number two, you had him with Beetlejuice, which, to, which in a way was kind of Michael Keaton's audition to play Batman, and he kills it in this movie. He's so good as Bruce Wayne. He's even better as Batman. He doesn't need a voice you know, uh, changer. He doesn't need to go growly like Christian Bale does. I'm Batman, you know? He just does it because he knows how to bring it, and he brings it in this movie. Batman Returns! Yeah, maybe not so much. But the second one, the, the first one, the first one, the first one is gold. The first one is the GOAT when it comes to the original Batman franchise. For me, it is the GOAT. It is the gold medal winner. 89's Tim Burton film, I will put that up against a couple of different Batman films any day of the week and twice on Sunday. If you are not enjoying this film, if you are not smiling, if you are not getting jiggy with it during the museum dancing scene. I don't know what's wrong with your life. And especially when he brings out the balloons and he's hubba, 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 money, money, money. Who do you trust? Me? I'm giving away free money. When he gives away free money and you have trust by Prince playing, you really can't go wrong for that time. It just works. And also, let's not forget. See, there you go. So you know what I'm talking about. And let's not forget the number one person in this movie is Bob. Bob is our number one guy. He always has been, and he always will be to a certain extent. And by the way, my friend and I reenacted a scene from this movie. It's on his YouTube channel. I'll send you guys the link later. It's so much fun. We had so much fun shooting that. But man, 89's Batman is my number four. It is one of my favorite comic movies. It is my favorite Batman movie, even though I think there are other Batman films that are the best. But when it comes to favorites... This is my favorite. Are you guys a fan of this? I couldn't tell from the music in the background. Before Nazario goes, I just have to say, I don't know how you go from having getting Nazario on your side to completely losing him in one conversation. <laughs> yeah, he was like, I think he hurt his feelings with uh, the Batman Returns. I don't know how that happens, but you do it. I'm sorry. I'm just not, a, fan ahead, of I'm not a big fan of Batman Returns. I'm sorry, I'm not. To me, that's not really much of a Batman film. That's a Tim Burton movie. That's not a Batman movie. But, Hell yeah. yeah. And that is why it's a great fucking film. Because Tim <laughs> I Burton don't know about do that. that. No, he wanted to do. 89 so, Batman is great. My first opinion on this is too fucking low, man. Four? <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> everything okay. you said about this movie is true. This movie is great. I, I know some people find it very... Uh, like, similar to, to First Gump. It has an age grade. Yeah. To those people, I say, fuck them. <laughs> this movie is amazing. To this day, that is the best Batmobile ever put to oh, screen. Yes, yes. It's beautiful. 
I still haven't built my 3,000 piece Lego set, but it's going to be like this thing, this big, and I'm going to put it in my table. And I love that thing when I'm finished doing it. Yes, I think Keaton is the best Batman by far. I think he had a great presence at both characters. Usually, uh, other actors are excel at one side and not really the other. Bale is a strong Batman, and I can say objectively, that trilogy probably surpasses what the other Batman's movies were doing. But I still, to this day, hate the voice. Why did he make that choice? Take me out of it from a bit, but definitely, I mean, props, my man. You have a bad taste when it comes to sequels, but the original. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's start off by saying the objective, subjective argument. Fuck that argument. There is no objective in art it's subjective all the way no one can be 100 percent objective you can go fuck yourself with objective <laughs> second of all fuck the people who say this isn't a great batman this is my fucking favorite batman it's movie so i love keaton to death he's fucking amazing in this movie jack nicholson is fucking killer in this movie this is a great fucking pick batman returns i love as well mm, so i'm not with you on that. i'm with nazari on that i love both of them Fair enough. There's this some is good a great fucking movie. But also, since you did make a choice in the last episode, I'm expecting the top three here to have one from that motherfucker in here. <laughs> you there is it. We gonna have some issues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> Numero tres. You know what? Um, I'm gonna call an audible. I have something at three, but I'm gonna call an audible. Uh. I'm gonna. He convinced you, didn't he? He convinced you. I mean, I don't know. I, I should probably call an audible on this because it's been so long since I've seen this particular film. I probably should put it somewhere else and put something else in. Am I allowed to call an audible on this show, or is that yeah, not allowed? Fuck it. There's yeah. no rule. You can do whatever you want, man. Can I call an audible? Okay, yeah. I'm gonna call an audible. Right. So we're gonna take that movie. We're gonna throw it over here. We're gonna put something in its place. Right. So. You know, this was I got I got to give love to this one because this one has a bit just a bit. I it's on my favorite list, so I'll put it there. This movie introduced me to another character that is very well known in the community, right? It's very well known in the community. And I liked this movie. I was laughing during the course of this film. I was smiling during certain sequences. And when I've rewatched it most recently, a few I think it was a few weeks ago, I rewatched it just to see if it, you know, just to see if some things hold up, right? The score in this movie is so good by John Williams. It's kind of hard to say. How can you not enjoy this movie? And how can you not put it in some way, shape, or form on a top 10 list? Whatever list it may be, respectively. I'm going to go with the adventurer himself, Indiana Jones, but I'm going to go with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I'm going with the Last Crusade because when you have Sean Connery playing your dad, when you have lines like, it's a new experience for me. It happens to me all the time. It's like, they got a tank, six pound gun. What do you think you're doing? Get down. Dad, we're well out of range. And then the thing ends up blowing up their car. They call, but don't tell my brother in law. Come on, come on. It's just, it's so, it's so adventurous. It's so fun. And uh, the, the score in this movie is so good. It's so good. You actually feel like you're in the time period that it's set in the 1930s. But you also feel like you're in the Crusades where they talk about certain, you know, famous characters in the Grail Knight and where he comes from and all his stuff. You just feel like you're there. You just feel like it. And it's such a great – it has a – It's the movie has a great MacGuffin. I think this movie has a really good MacGuffin in it. So I'm giving it to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. First Indiana Jones movie I ever saw. First uh, – one of the first Sean Connery movies I ever saw. And just – it's fun. It's fun. And the score is great. So Spielberg. Guess what? You made my list, man. You made my list. I'm going to give you Last Crusade. Even though I think we're outside of that, the best indie film is Raiders, but my favorite has got to be Last Crusade. So I'm going with Indiana Jones and Last Crusade. What do you think about this movie? Have you guys seen this at all? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Mike. You can never go wrong with Spielberg. So whatever you were going to pick for Spielberg, I was going to love. Now, especially in this trilogy, you can go no wrong. I love the third one. It is my third favorite Indiana Jones movie, but I still love it to fucking death. 
I love the hell out of this movie. It is so fucking fantastic. It was a great ending to the Indiana Jones character. You know, this is where it ended, and it's good times that it ended at this moment with the sun setting and everything going. The between him and Sean Connery are fucking incredible in this movie. John Leaf Davies bringing John Leaf Davies back was the best decision they could have fucking done because he is fucking fantastic in this movie. I love everything about this movie. It is such a great fucking movie. Papers, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we You're got right. the quote all right. <laughs> yeah, uh, just like Ryan, actually, this was the first one I ever saw. Uh, my dad took me to the theaters to see it without even telling me it was a sequel. I just figure out, like, well, the movie's called Indiana Jones. Uh, <laughs> today. And then he's like, yeah, and there's so many more I can show you on TV and uh, at the house. I was like, what? Why didn't you just show me before you took me to the theater? Anyway, uh, I like it a lot. It's probably, uh, objectively speaking, the second best one uh, out of the three because, weirdly enough, they never made anything after 1989. It, I mean, I think they were so much material. They could have done at least one more, but they guess they chose to not to. But, yeah, uh, this movie is pretty great. I love Temple of Doom, even if everybody thinks it's crap. And I, ro I, watch, I watch Raiders as the last one I saw. So by the time I saw Raiders, I guess it felt like, okay, I kind of have seen this, but because I see the sequels after. So Raiders never really got to me as strong as this one and Temple. Still, it's a good pick, actually, for number three of all time. Sometimes Weird that you didn't do Raiders, though, because most people would have done Raiders. Yeah, well, to me, I think Raiders is the best indie film, but my favorite is Last Crusade. I'll just put it that way. Raiders is great. Sure. That score is so ominous. Whew. So ominous that score. Number two. Hmm. Man, it's probably a good thing I called an audible on that last one. <laughs> All right. I don't know if these last two are going to do much better, but we'll see. Um, <clears throat> Coming at number two, because I flipped one and two as I was making this list. I had to switch them, because I did a rewatch of one film over the other, right? So, number two, someone's phone's ringing, or is that the Halloween? Yeah, that was me. Oh, okay. I was like, is Jamie Lee Curtis calling? Um, I was thinking you were going to put Halloween on the list, but sure. Yeah, the second film isn't coming out until next Halloween, unfortunately. But anyway, um, where was I going with this? Yeah, number two, right, yeah. So, number two, <laughs> number two. Uh, I saw this movie more times in a theater than a certain other film on this that may or may not be on this list. I went into I went into this film so hyped because the last few films of this franchise, when I was a kid, I thought they were cool. Looking back on them, I'm like, yeah, that trilogy, boy, ooh, two and three especially, ooh, ooh, nasty, not good. Didn't do it. Didn't do the franchise any favors. But when this film was coming out, and you had a filmmaker who had a pretty good track record already with rebooting franchises, I was jacked up. I was very excited to see what he was going to do with this. And it came in like a hurricane. It just came in and took us on a wild ride, and it was great from beginning to end. Yeah, you could say it's a rehash of another movie, but I don't care. I don't care. I enjoy it for what it is. If there's if there's one scene in this movie I would take out, we'll get to that in a minute. But overall, this film made me a bigger fan of Star Wars than than the pre, than the prequels ever did. I'll give you that right now. I'm going with Star Wars: The Force Awakens. That's right, folks. I'm going to shock the world. I'm going to shock your comment section. I'm going to give you Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. I saw this six times in a theater. Smile on my face from beginning to end. I was clapping like crazy at the end of the first viewing. I was going Ric Flair. Whoa! Greatest of all time! Greatest of all time! Like, I was on a big high after seeing this movie for so many different reasons. I wish my dad was there with me to see it. He was there in spirit. He may not have been there physically, but he was there in spirit to see this movie with us. It was great. It was awesome. I saw it at a couple of different theaters in the first couple of weeks that it opened up, respectively. I love it. It makes me a bigger fan of Star Wars. It makes me love Star Wars even more than I did when I was a little youngin'. So kudos to J.J. Abrams and company because Star Wars The Force Awakens is a darn good film. Yes, it has maybe one or two things I would have liked to have taken out. The Reth Tar scene, oh my gosh. Probably would have taken that out. But other than that, we got an introduction to three hot, young, up-and-coming actors in the movie. Even though some of them have done stuff before, I had no idea who these people were until this movie. John Boyega, Adam Driver, Daisy Ridley. 
Daisy Ridley has a bright future in Hollywood, folks. It's a fact, Jack. So I cannot wait to see what she does next. I cannot wait to see how many Oscars she's going to get on her mantle once her career is all said and done and the dust settles. But I'm going to give it. Star Wars The Force Awakens. The Force did awaken this franchise, and The Force is very strong with this film. Don't know if my pa the panel here is going to feel the same way, but hey, that's the beauty of filmmaking, folks. What do you think about Episode 7, fellas? I'm just going to say first, if you like John Boyega, watch this. Yeah, it's fucking amazing. I've yeah. heard good things about it. I've heard good things about it. Uh, it's better than this. <laughs> wow, hot take. All right. No, no, I mean, to be fair, this movie is not bad. This movie is good, but there are at least five Star Wars movies that are better than this. I get that. At I least. completely get it. Uh, Weird pick, honestly, because yes, it's basically doing uh, a new hope again with different characters. It, it does introduce Kylo Ren, which I think he becomes a better and more interesting character later. Ray grew into a great character and then crashed and burned. And I BB-8 is cute. I I own a BB-8. I don't know, Mike. <laughs> okay. I've talked about this a little bit on different shows. I'm not the biggest Star Wars guy. I I think they're all good movies. This one definitely is lower on my list than the other ones. But I knew this was coming from you. You talk about this all the time, so I figured this was coming. So I get it. And, and that's why it's hard for me to really say anything good or bad about Star Wars because I'm just not a huge fan of this franchise so it doesn't shock me when one goes over the other <laughs> you know what second best movie of all time i think i would have taken the last jedi here maybe empire oh, oh, oh. but not this one yeah i get it it's, it's, a, a, it's 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 a rough sell my man yeah i get it i get it a lot of people say it's a well, rehash of new hope you can it. always redeem yourself yes yeah because it's time, guys, for the movie. For the number one. The best film of all time. Give it to And me. if you guys watched something before, just act like you didn't watch it. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. The best. Unequivocally. Yeah. Movie ever made. Yeah. Should be on the background of when Nazario has here. <laughs> of course. Please. Should should I or shouldn't I call a last minute split second audible just to save my reputation? I don't know if I should or not. Oh boy. Um, well, let's just say after pick two, you ain't saving shit. <laughs> Might as well just go with what you have right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'll go with it. I already used. My safe, I already used what is called a safety net in some way, shape, or form. So I'll, I'll just. Hey, I'll just. I'll let. I'll let it roll. Let's let it roll, right? All right. So number one, uh, like I said, he's my favorite comic book character of all time. He's my favorite Boom. superhero of all time. Boom. And I think he deserves to be in a billion other films before the age of fifty, because he's only like what pushing forty right now. He needs to be in like. 50,000 other movies by the time he turns 50. Uh, Henry Cavill, <laughs> you get the gold medal, my friend. Man of Steel, oh, give yeah. it to you. Because this movie, despite the destruction and how much darkness there is in this movie, it gives me so much hope by the end of it because Jarrell's speech and the flight sequence and the Hans Zimmer score are so worth watching. Even if you don't watch the whole two and a half hour cut of the film, Watch the five-minute scene of Russell Crowe giving that speech to Henry Cavill in the ship slash Fortress of Solitude. And then he comes out. The doors open. You see him in that ridiculously good-looking suit. And you see him, should I try to fly? Should I not fly? He does it. Have, has a few blunders along the way. And then he accepts his true power. He tests his limits. Goes up, up, and away into that sky with that epic score that just makes you want to fly even though you really can't because we're human. We're not Kryptonian. I wish I was Kryptonian, but I'm not. Um, yeah. So Zack Snyder, as much hate as this man gets, as much disrespect as this man gets on the internet, I'm going to give him credit where credit's due because this, to me, is the best Zack Snyder film I've ever seen. Seriously, this is 
Bar none. Better than 300. A billion times better than Watchmen. Sorry, people who are fans of that film. I don't get it. It's a dark, depressing movie. I don't get it. But Man of Steel is hopeful. It's uplifting. At the end of it, you may not think two-thirds of it, but the very end when he shows up at the Daily Planet with that outfit and that smile on his face when Lois Lane says, Welcome to the planet. It's good to be here, Lois. And then, boom, the score kicks in with the end credits. Booyah. That's a great way to end a movie. So Man of Steel is the winner of this list it is the number one film for me shocker i know right mazzaro had to get on his phone to let somebody know he was so shocked oh yeah. no really who did you call Batman. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow you called the bat cave let batman know what was happening all right he picked up on the red phone it was weird <laughs> I'm sorry, you man. There's no saving this pick. <laughs> I, I, I cannot do anything for you here. The movie okay. is good. I have gone on record saying that I like this film. It's okay. But best movie ever made. Oof. I know. Rich, man. That's just crazy. Mike, <laughs> Superman. I've already said it before. Not the biggest Superman fan, but, you know, it's a good movie. Mm. Number one. Number nice. ten. Holy fucking shit. But, you know. <laughs> the comment section. It is what it is. Up. You know what? We knew this was coming with the quote, man. We knew. If I could we have made a top 300 movies list, they still would not have made that list. But. Wow. Other than that, I kind of like it. It's okay. It's okay. We can talk, we can talk more off camera about what my audible would have been. <laughs> That's it, guys. This was fun. Yeah. yeah. Also rough. <laughs> but fun. Thanks for Ryan for being here. Thanks for Mike. It's been another great episode of Emrek. Mike, we've been ranking too much shit. I know. We got to stop this shit. We won't rank anything next week. <laughs> Promise. So. See you guys. You should be ashamed!